So one could uh, speculate that using this VU chemical in combination with an agonist of the nicotinic cholinergic receptors, which we know much more about, could yield a better, uh, a better response in terms of cognition than just inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, the enzyme that limits acetylcholine uh, in the brain. Hello friends, welcome to another segment from my series on the cholinergic system. In this uh, video, we're going to discuss uh, some of the most notable muscarinic cholinergic agonists. To review briefly, uh, what we've been discussing so far is the role of acetylcholine in the brain. Um, in particular, we discussed choline as a, um, an essential nutrient we discussed how it works in the brain as acetylcholine. We discussed its role in um, cognitive decline. And we discussed the inhibition of the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. That the enzyme, it's the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine in the brain. So when you inhibit that, that enzyme, you get more acetylcholine, more of that neurotransmitter in the brain, which yields uh, better, co better cognition. Now, as I pointed out before, the problem with inhibiting acetylcholinesterase is that it is non-selective. When you ac inhibit acetylcholinesterase, you are agonizing all of the cholinergic receptors. And you may not want to do that. So in this section, we've been talking about, in the last video in particular, we were talking about the muscarinic cholinergic receptors, which are five of the cholinergic receptors overall. The other class are called nicotinic cholinergic receptors, which to be honest with you, are much more interesting than these ones. So I wanted to deal with the muscarinic ones first to get them out of the way. Nonetheless, they are slightly interesting. In particular, as I described before, the M1 receptor is quite interesting and the M4 receptor may be interesting as well. In this section, I'm going to talk about how, uh, I'm gonna talk about the agonists that we know uh, of that are either pharmaceutically made or herbal agonists that agonize muscarinic receptors. Now I'd like to point you guys' attention to the link below of my blog post on this subject because um, you'll be able to get more detailed information there as well as uh, extensive citations from my very long review on the cholinergic system. Uh, not long, but exhaustive 25 page review. Um, but this section that you'll be linked to in the blog post is quite short and easily readable. And I'm going to just give you the highlights of it in this video talk. So to begin, the most well-known use of muscarinic cholinergic agonists, which means things that stimulate the muscarinic cholinergic receptors, is actually an ancient pra uh, practice in Asia called the chewing of pan. At least in India, it's called pan, uh, written P-A-A-N. Pan is actually composed of two components. One is the areca nut and one is the betel leaf. They're combined together and chewed uh, and this produces a stimulatory effect and also leads to excessive salivation, something similar to what you would see in the US with chewing tobacco, which leads people to spit the remnants of this, the saliva as well as the remnants of the areca nut and betel leaf on the ground creating very red uh, markings that are considered vandalism. Because of this reason, chewing the uh, pan has been banned in a variety of countries. Although it is still practiced extensively in India and in South, South Asia in general, as well as in Southeast Asia, and as well as particularly in Taiwan in East Asia. Now, uh, interestingly, by the way, let's note one thing. This practice is really old. It predates the end of the agricultural revolution, uh, particularly the end of the Neolith Neolithic revolution. So there is evidence of chewing pan, although it was probably not called pan, in the Philippines from 4.5 thousand years ago. So it's quite ancient. People have been agonizing their muscarinic receptors for quite a while. And what it is that agonizes the muscarinic receptor specifically is the areca nut. There is something called uh, arecholine, 
which sounds very similar to choline, huh? not coincidentally. Uh, aricholine is a derivative of the Arica nut that is an agonist of the muscarinic cholinergic receptors. Now, unfortunately, pan, particularly the Arica nut, chewing it is proven to be, well, shown to be carcinogenic. It can cause uh, oral cancers uh, quite rapidly. Um, actually, possibly more rapidly than nicotine, chewing nicotine does. So it's not really a great option, but it's something interesting to note that the stimulation of muscarinic receptors has been going on for quite a while. Now, in our talk, we're going to talk about pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutically created, uh, most of them are actually created by researchers at universities, compounds that agonize selectively muscarinic receptors. And why do they have to be selectively agonized? Well, the reason is because most of the muscarinic receptors do not play a great role in cognition that we know of, while they do play a very large role in physiological processes. So we don't, and, and that's why, by the way, a lot of these um, chemicals will have significant side effects in terms of gastrointestinal distress or nausea and things like that, which is also why the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors particularly the stronger ones, cause similar effects because those things also agonize the muscarinic receptors because they are non-selective agonists. They just upregulate, I mean, they allow larger amounts of acetylcholine in the brain, which then also agonizes these same five muscarinic receptors. Now, the first one we'll talk about is the most well-known of these compounds. The rest of these compounds are not well-known except to researchers very specialized in the muscarinic cholinergic system. But this one is a little bit more well-known and it's called xanomelene. Xanomelene is the least selective of the compounds that I'll be describing. It agonizes the M1 and M4 receptors that have been shown to play a role in cognition. Now, unfortunately, it also antagonizes the dopaminergic system. In fact, it seems to have the largest anti-dopaminergic effect of the lot that I'm describing now. Um, unlike the rest of the compounds that I'm going to describe, it has been shown to have a uh, to show, to uh, induce an improvement in cognition in Alzheimer's disease patients in placebo controlled trials. Unfortunately, as one would expect from such a non-selective agonist, it also causes GI distress, that is gastrointestinal distress in the Alzheimer's disease patients. But uh, it's quite interesting nonetheless because it proves that uh, or not proves but indicates that um, agonizing the M1 and M4 receptors can cause improvements in human cognition, which leads us to want to research more selective agonists. So on that path, the next one we could talk about is the TBPB agonist. Now the TBPB uh, agonist of the muscarinic, by the way, TBPB is an acronym from the chemical name, which is very hard to pronounce, so I'm not even gonna try it, but it's in my blog post if you'd like to read it. So TBPB agonizes the M1 receptor, which is one of the two receptors we care about, and it seems to be the more important receptor for cognition. Uniquely among the compounds I'm going to describe, it antagonizes the M2 to the M5 receptors meaning that it blocks activity at those receptors while it directly stimulates the M1 receptor. Unfortunately, it also antagonizes the D2 dopamine 2 receptor, which means that it blocks activity at one of the dopamine receptors. For people that do not have a pathological addiction uh, problem or do not have a schizophrenia that is dependent on overactivity at the dopaminergic uh, neurons, this is probably not very desirable but still very interesting that this chemical compound could block some receptors and antagonize exactly the one that we, I mean, agonize exactly the one that we wanted to agonize. Now, uh, the next compound we'd like to talk about is called BQCA, which is again a, an acronym based on the chemical name of the compound, which is again hard to pronounce and I'm not going to try and it takes about a whole sentence to record it. So, so anyway, um, this compound is quite interesting as well. It is Unlike the rest, uh, it is a positive allosteric modulator of the M1 receptor. It does not directly agonize the M1 receptor. Instead, it makes the M1 receptor more sensitive to agonists, such as acetylcholine. In fact, it doubles the uh, sensitivity of the M1 receptor to acetylcholine. Now, if you recall from our earlier videos, there was one of the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor uh, drugs called galantamine uh, 
that also did a similar thing. It sensitized the cholinergic receptors to acetylcholine. But this drug does it particularly to one receptor, the M1 receptor that we are particularly interested in. And it has no effect on the M2 to M5 receptors. Uh, what's also interesting about this receptor, although we're not quite sure how it affects the dopaminergic uh, neurons directly or the receptors individually, we do know that in rodent studies it has been shown to decrease the neurological effects of amphetamine which means that it must have some effect on the dopamine receptors which again is probably not something that we really want it has been shown in rodents to improve learning and uh, memory so that's uh, another uh, well it's in an animal study but it's another evidence of the efficacy of improving sensitivity at the m1 receptor even without directly agonizing it the problem is even the rodents got uh, high amounts of diarrhea almost prohibitory diarrhea from the uh, from the bqca which probably uh, the researchers postulate is probably because it does not cross the blood brain barrier very well so higher doses of it need to be used to get it into the blood brain uh, into the brain so this may be the reason this is a problem with it and this is one reason that inspired further formulations to try to get something that was going to go across the blood brain barrier uh, better than this uh, a third compound to discuss out of these is the uh, 77LH281 uh, compound. Now it's, it's quite a well-known compound. It has uh, 100 times more affinity for the M1 receptor than it does for the M2 to M5 receptors. Which means again, it's much more specific to the M1 receptor, which is the one that we think has the most to do with cognition. Unfortunately, or it's not really unfortunate. In this case, it doesn't block the dopamine receptors, but it does something very unusual. It agonizes the dopamine D1 receptor, I mean, sorry, the dopamine D2 receptor, which is quite unusual, which means it stimulates the dopamine 2 receptor and it stimulates the serotonin receptor 5-HT2B, which means that it produces a serotonergic dopaminergic uh, response in the animal which seems to indicate that it may have an antidepressant effect which may not be good to use long term but in the short term it may have an anxiolytic and antidepressant effect in uh, along with its effect on the M1 receptor which should improve cognition um, now the final two compounds that I'd like to mention to you guys are compounds both created by Vanderbilt University I was surprised recently to discover that Vanderbilt University has uh, improved quite a bit in the US rankings uh, of undergraduate universities. It's now listed in the top 25, which is uh, surprising to me because it was not listed nearly as highly when I was uh, in undergrad myself. It seems that the school is doing quite well in their research, as is evidenced by their extreme, uh, extremely detailed and prolific um, production of chemical compounds that agonize the muscarinic receptors. So in particular, I'll draw your attention to two of them. One is the more notable or more well-known one, which is uh, called V, they're all called VU, Vanderbilt University. It's called VU0357017. And this compound is a weak agonist of the M1 receptor and a partial antagonist of the D2 receptor, the dopamine receptor, which means it blocks the D2 receptor as well. See, a lot of these chemicals seem to do that, right? So it blocks the D2 receptor a little bit as well as weakly activating the M1 receptor. But what's interesting about this is it's the only compound of the list that's been shown, proven to attenuate liver damage in rodents. So when this compound is given and it activates the M1 receptor and uh, a hepatotoxic or hepatotoxic or um, some kind of liver injury is, is created in the rodents, they recover better than if the compound was not given to them. So this is quite interesting and promising and confirms the theoretical role that these receptors have on liver injury. Now, the Vanderbilt University uh, researchers, who are very interesting and who I plan to try to interview some of them for my channel, um, they continue to, uh, they're chemists, and they continue to play with these molecules to try to improve the selectivity of the uh, stimulation at the M1 receptor. And what they did particularly is they replaced the ethyl linker of the uh, aforementioned VU compound with uh, three amino um, Peperidine uh, to change the chemical structure and tried it out and it turned out that with this transformation uh, 
the M1 uh, agonism was maintained while the D2 antagonism was finally, finally removed. So this, uh, you'll note, is the only compound, by the way, it's called the VU0364572 is the compound I'm talking about. Um, it's very interesting because this is the only compound of the list that I've mentioned so far that shows absolutely no effect on dopaminergic uh, receptors. So this means that, or the dopamine receptor. So this means that it may have, and now, and these, the, the Vanderbilt University compounds, both of them, have not been tried in humans. So we don't know how much uh, GI distress people might have might experience from them. But this last one is particularly promising because it's basically, from what we can tell, a direct agonist of the M1 cholinergic uh, receptor without affecting any other receptors and without affecting the dopamine receptor. So this is very interesting because generally speaking, although it may be helpful to uh, agonize the M4 receptor as well, it seems that the M1 receptor is the most important for cognition. It's, we know from uh, trials on the other compounds that agonizing the muscarinic cholinergic receptors without agonizing the nicotinic cholinergic receptors can yield improvements in cognition in humans. And we know that agonizing the M1 receptor seems to be the most promising. Agonizing it selectively will, should produce the least side effects. And this chemical is the only one that will not uh, interfere with the dopaminergic system. So one could uh, speculate that using this VU chemical in combination with an agonist of the nicotinic cholinergic receptors, which we know much more about, could yield a better, uh, a better response in terms of cognition than just inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, the enzyme that limits acetylcholine uh, in the brain. Because having more acetylcholine in the brain is indiscriminate and it's non-selective and it affects all the receptors. Whereas we want to try to optimize our agonism of the receptors. So I hope you guys enjoyed this detailed uh, review of chemicals that can affect the muscarinic cholinergic receptors. In the next video, I will be discussing the muscarinic cholinergic uh, genes as well as antag briefly antagonism of the muscarinic cholinergic receptors, which means blocking the receptors. Uh, anyway, I wish you guys a fruitful day. Be sure to check out the blog linked below if you'd like more information and we'll see you next time.